British Ecological Society webinar, How to Get Published. I say good morning, but one of our presenters is uh, in New Zealand, so uh, it's midnight there. So well done for him for staying up so late to talk to us. Um, we have three excellent presenters today. Daniel Stauffer, as I already said, from Canterbury, New Zealand. Katie Field from Leeds. And Alison Bennett from the Jane Cook Institute, both of course here in the UK. Um, the order in which they get, well, all three of them, I should say, uh, well, I should say who I am, first of all. I'm Ken Thompson. I'm one of the senior editors of Functional Ecology, one of the British journals. And all three of our presenters today are associate editors of the British Ecological Society. Daniel is on the editorial board of the Journal of Applied Ecology. And Katie and Alison work with me. I, I wondered whether to um, make any opening remarks at all. In the first place, I don't really want to tread on the toes of any of the speakers this evening. And in the second place, I think we have three such fascinating presentations. Right. Our first speaker is Ken Field. He, he appears to have gone very, very quiet. Oh, sorry, me. <laughs> I can't hear you very well, Ken. Oh, sorry, sorry. Can it? Can everyone? <laughs> Is that just you, Katie, or is it? Is it uh, or, I can hear you when you speak loudly. Oh, ah, okay. Me too. I'm kind of, okay. Anyway, I, I just introduced you, Katie. I'm sorry. Oh, you, okay. Thanks, Ken. I wasn't <laughs> shouting. I wasn't shouting loudly. I'm sorry. I'm I'll, sorry. I'll, just, I'll shout a bit louder in future. Okay, okay lovely. Away. All right, thank you. Sorry about that, Ken. So yeah, I'm Katie Field from the University of Leeds, and hopefully you can all see that presentation that I've popped on the screen there. So if you bear with me, I've not done one of these before, so it's a bit strange for me, but we'll see how it goes. Uh, hopefully everyone can hear me. If not, um, contact you know web addresses, just so email address, sorry, it's just in the box um, on the side there. So. The point of this webinar is to talk you through the process of how to get published from taking your work from being in prep right through to getting it into in press. Um, now, publishing your work, it can feel like an arduous journey right from where you submit your manuscript through various stages of rejection and revision through to eventually being accepted. And I think if anyone's been through this process, you'll identify with this end picture here of how it feels when your paper finally comes out. Um, certainly feels like you've come through a journey. Um, in order to make that process as quick and painless as you possibly can, one of the most important things to do is to make sure you select the right journal that you're submitting your work to. So, in this case, you might argue this figure here, she may have chosen the wrong journal to submit her article to if it's taken about what, four or five years to get published. That's not a typical approach. That's not typical, I would say. Um, right. So when you're selected, the first thing you need to do is select the journal that's right for your work. And in order to do this, you need to ask yourself a key question. Um, that key question should be, who is it that you want to read your paper? Um, this is really important because different journals have different audiences. So I've picked three different individual journals, but these are kind of representative of, of groups of journals. So the first group is the one that I've illustrated with Nature, which is a very broad, wide-reaching journal, which has a wide variety of subjects right through from physics through to biology. Um, and it has very few long, in-depth articles, instead relying on 
shorter, snappier, letter-style articles. Journals like this have a really broad general audience, and so the, the research that they publish tends to be um, groundbreaking, earth-shattering, new advances that change, the, change life as we know it. They tend to be articles like that. Because of that, their impact factor is huge. It's around, well, for this year, I believe it's 41 and a well, 41.5 for their impact factor. Other journals are more specialised. So I've picked functional ecology because it's my favourite, obviously. Um, and it's journals like this have a more specialised, um, targeted audience. So in this case, it's um, aiming at ecologists. Um, now, the articles that a journal like functional ecology will, will print um, tend to be over quite a wide variety of subjects, but they all surround a central theme in this case, ecology. Um, these sorts of journals publish significant advances in the field, really interesting research um, that is general interest, but perhaps not quite as broad interest as something like nature. Um, the impact factor on journals like this, again, it's quite high, so you're expecting it above sort of three or four, um, which for an ecology journal puts it in the top 10, I believe. Um, the third type of journal I've got here is one of my personal favourite journals, it's the Fern Gazette. Um, so journals like this are targeted towards a very niche audience of specialists um, and they really target people who are fully in, or only interested in that field and they publish um, research that is in advance in a specific field, in this case in, in um, Fern Biology. Um, as a result of that, the impact factor is very low, but anyone who's anyone in fern biology will be reading the Fern Gazette. So that kind of brings me on to my next thing about it being really important to think about who it is that you're trying to reach with your article. Um, this is because in order for you to achieve maximum impact with your research, um, you want the right people to be reading it and citing it. So before you even start beginning to write your article, you should be asking yourself some honest some questions and answering them honestly. So ask yourself questions like, how general appeal is this research? Like, really how general appeal? You might think your mum's interested in it, but is she really? And then also, how important are your findings? How really important are your findings? Are they just important within your group, your field, or have they got wider um, impact? Then ask your supervisor or your PI on your project exactly the same questions. They're much more experienced than you and they've got a better idea of whether what you've got is actually exciting enough for something like nature or whether it's something that's more specialist and more suited to something more like the Fern Gazette, for example. Other things to consider when you're thinking about what your audience should do for your article is um, which journal content pages do you regularly get and which ones are the ones that you actually read? So we all sign up for various tables of contents, but I know in my, I, I, I certainly am selective in the ones I actually open and peruse. Um, secondly, which are the journals that you cite regularly? Um, so once you, when, when you're writing or when you're looking at other people's research, which, which journals are you looking at and citing from? Um, and then ask your colleagues, think about your colleagues, people working in the same field that you're working in. Which journal content pages do they regularly get and read? And which articles are they regularly citing? Um, it's really incredible and amazing to be published in a really high profile journal, something like you know, Nature or Science. But if the people who are working in that field don't actually read that journal, um, and then they won't cite it, your, your paper isn't actually worth that much in the end. Um, right, so that brings me on to impact factors. So another thing you might consider whilst you're um, selecting your journal, and I'm sure you will come into play, is impact factor. So all an impact factor is, it's nothing mysterious, it's just a metric that's calculated based on how often the average article that's printed in that journal is cited in a year. So a high impact uh, uh, journal article is more likely to be cited more times than one in a lower impact journal. Um, Higher impact journals are often considered to be more prestigious, as illustrated here. Um, however, you should try not to be swayed by impact factor alone. Um, if you're publishing your work in a journal that has an impact factor of maybe 10 or 11, but it's actually a microbiology journal, and your research community are reading ecology journals, 
then it's likely your paper might get unnoticed for a while and it's not likely to get cited as much as if you targeted maybe a lower impact journal that had a better targeted audience for your work. So it's really important to choose the journal that you and your colleagues actually read and talk about the most, even if the impact factor isn't tremendous. So you've decided what sort of journal it is that you want to publish in. Um, obviously, it's going to be something like functional ecology, of course. Um, so the second thing you need to do is check the specific journal aims and scope um, or the equivalent. And you can do that by clicking, going onto the journal's website, and there's always a menu on there. Um, it's either along the side or it'll be along the top, and there'll be a subheading on there, something like aims and scope, or it might be called about this journal or something like that. If you click that, um, it will take you through to the actual description of what that journal is trying to achieve. Now, it's really important that you try and do this before you start writing, and absolutely, definitely before you start submitting anything. It's, really, it's important to remember that if you submit an article to a journal that doesn't fit in its aims and scope, then you've got absolutely zero chance of it being accepted and you just extend that process for yourself. So once you've clicked that, you'll come up with a page like this. So on functional ecology, you can see it's quite clear exactly what sort of uh, research that the um, editors of functional ecology are interested in publishing. Um, I've highlighted on this. The, um, the really important bits, um, but it's really important that you read through this and then you ask yourself honestly, again, don't kid yourself, there's absolutely no point, but ask yourself honestly, does your research fit within that description? Now, most of the time, it, you'll be able to say yes, because you'll have selected the journal based on um, what you've actually done. But if it is something that's very specific and you think you might or not, there's no harm in sending an email to the editor and saying, I've done this research and I think it's interesting, it might be of interest to you, send them an email and describe it um, and then they'll email you back and say yeah please submit it or don't bother um, okay so another thing you might want to consider when you're choosing your journal is whether it has an open access option or not so open access purely means whether your paper can be downloaded freely and read by anybody or whether it's if it's not open access it might well be um, that it's restricted to subscriber access only um, most journals will offer open access as an option, um, but that option often incurs an author fee and it can range from a few hundred to a few thousand pounds. Um, so it's something to bear in mind when you're picking your journal. Um, this is an interesting point here that actually more recent RCUK funded work is actually a stipulation in the funding that it has to be published in a journal with an open access policy of some description. Um, you need to check with your institution and your funder, if you're funded by RCUK, what the actual guidelines are and maybe access to a central pot of funds that will actually pay for your, your article to become open access. So it's worth investigating that because you can up the impact your article has if you do it open access um, as an option. Um, so yeah, your work may well reach a broader audience than if it was subscriber only. Um, and that if you're reaching more people, it's more likely you're going to get more cited. Um, which is at the end of the day, that's what you want. Um, and it is also good because it means that work that might not otherwise have been picked up by journals, so work that's scientifically sound and there's nothing, it's, it's, it's got solid data in there, um, but isn't especially exciting, it also gives that a place that it can be published. Um, now, on the downside, that by publishing that sort of work, it won't get cited very much, but and it can reduce the impact factor of that journal. But it is a really important resource and it's a good it's a good way that that research is getting out there um there's several different levels of open access but only two that you probably want to worry about you might not even need to worry about these um the first level is called green open access um and this is just a definition taken off wikipedia that self-archiving of non-open access journal articles so this is where you publish your research in a, in a journal that doesn't have an open access um, option or you've not paid for the open access option, but you can deposit that article either in the accepted manuscript form or as the published article itself, you can deposit it into a repository. So this is an example of one that I've taken. It's a White Rose um, Research Online. It's their repository. So that's the Universities of Leeds, Sheffield and York. Um, and any research conducted by those universities 
um, the articles that are resulting from that get deposited into this database and it means that anyone can access them that way. Um, so it's a, it's a different way of open access rather than directly from the um, publisher's website. The second one is the gold open access and this is where you publish your research in an open access journal. So there's journals out there, things like PLOS One, any of the PLOS ones that are um, open access. So you, you, upon acceptance, um, you get billed for publishing your article, um, and that then is open access for everyone else. Or in a subscription-based journal, you can pay a fee to make your article open access. Um, so that's the gold open access option, and you, you could use either of those. Like, they're the two most common that you'll come across anyway. Okay, so we go back to the you've decided that your research fits within this aims and scope and you're going to go ahead and pu publish in this journal so the second thing you really must do is click the author guidelines you'll be surprised how many people don't do this and it's an utter headache um, when you click that please download them print them and stick to the guidelines really take note of the word or page limits the figure guidelines the font sizes, the reference style, all of that boring formatting stuff. Before you start writing, take note and actually follow it as you go through. It just makes the whole process much more efficient for you. It makes the process more efficient for editors and also for the reviewers because they're not always having to comment that, oh, but it's 10,000 words over the guidelines. So please cut everything. It just, you know, stick guidelines. It's really worth it. Um, and that's basically it. Once you've decided that you've, um, you've got the right journal and you print out your guidelines it's time to start writing um, we we're asked to provide one top tip and this doesn't really relate to what I've talked about so I'll probably come back to it later um, but I think my top tip is not to take criticism of your research or your, your manuscript that you've prepared so carefully personally it's just it's something that happens everyone gets rejected and all that the reviewers and the editors are giving back to you is constructive criticism that are going to help make your paper better and also or and or direct it towards the right audience by suggesting a different journal and that's kind of all i've got to say about that subject that was uh, that was great katie really good cool, thank you i really i really i really should want, i mean you made this very clear actually but i think it's worth emphasizing that authors who want to publish or have to Someday, they often only think in terms of open access journals, mm. and of course that's 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 quite wrong. I mean, you can actually publish open access in any journal. Mm -hmm. so in fact, open access doesn't doesn't in any sense constrain the, the, the and you you made that perfect. Oh, good. <laughs> Emphasise that. For me. That's that's brilliant. So it's uh, well, we'll people are. I see Samina saying, feel free to post any questions in the Q and A session. We'll leave the Q and A session for all of our finish. So we'll we'll move on to uh, to Daniel. Okay. Great. Um. So my, I get the, the, the wonderful task of talking about the actual mechanics of, of writing your manuscript. So I, I'm not sure entirely um, writing your manuscript necessarily always comes after identifying the journal. Some people actually approach it in a different order. Personally, I think it, I almost always have a target um, journal in mind when I really am early on in the stage of, of the process because I think it helps for the many of the reasons that even that Katie said the guidelines can vary quite dramatically between some journals so you really do need to know what your target length is and things like that um, but uh, the other thing that I, w I would like to point out before I get into some of the the nuts and bolts is that I, I gave myself a subtitle here um, <laughs> calling this the fun part mostly in jest uh, my experience with many people, even including myself sometimes, is that we, as scientists, we, we enjoy conducting experiments or we enjoy going out into the field. 
um, or in, in my own case, solving some, some equations on a whiteboard, but we don't always uh, think of the manuscript and the writing process as the most pleasurable part. And unfortunately, the reality, well, I guess it's unfortunate, but also fortunate, the reality is we have to publish things because we, we can't just sit in our in our own um, ivory towers and and figure things out and then keep it to ourselves. Um, so one of the things I'm hoping to achieve uh, right now is perhaps to demystify some of the, the stumbling blocks and the things that get in the way and make it make writing a manuscript less fun than it could possibly be. Um, so uh, building in particular off of some of the things that, that Katie said in terms of the, the format of the, of the article, um, almost if we look at point number one, almost I would say probably 90 to 95 percent of the articles that are published in ecology or evolution uh, follow the same common structure. Um, so this would be the percentage that w didn't end up in those uh, very broad journals like what what Katie referred to um, in, as nature or science. And the article really just comes down into the four main components. It's, Every article, effectively every article, has an introduction, followed by a methods, followed by results, and, and followed by discussion at the end. And the way that, um, the, that most articles, or most effective articles actually, follow this, this procedure actually takes these pieces and turns it into what, what I've heard described as, as an hourglass, which so starts very broad in the introduction, Perhaps not not um, life and the meaning of, of life necessarily, but what's the 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 biggest the the main driving force within your field of the, of the question, and it starts to progressively get narrower and narrower at when you're setting up the key ideas and hypotheses that you want to test. At which point you you'll end up the methods, which is it tends to be much more specific. Um, and it's literally the methods and exactly what you have done in the course of, of your study. The results equally uh, tend to be about as specific as, as the methods. Um, but then once you have come out of the results and the key findings that you found in your specific uh, study system, for example, or in your experiments, then things start to actually broaden quite a bit again, uh, such that at the end of the discussion, You'll you'll come up with, uh, or you're, you'll normally describe the the say the future perspective perspective, or what are the really broad implications? Say if you're publishing in functional ecology, what are the broad implications of your study for almost the entire readership of of the journal? And and I think this this sort of hourglass shape is also was really nicely summarized in a in a recent blog post on. Um, the blog Dynamic Ecology, um, where uh, Brian McGill said that every article is structured or, or tends to have, every effective article that he handles as an editor, tends to have five pivotal paragraphs. The first is the abstract. I'm going to talk about the abstract in a few slides, so uh, I'll, I'll skip that for now. Um, the second pivotal paragraph is really that first paragraph of your article. And it's the one that sets the stage. It says, this is the key concept or phenomena that I really want to make an impact in, in my field. The, the third pivotal paragraph is the last paragraph of your introduction. And while there's some variations on the theme, it tends to, if you, if you go through, say, functional ecology or journal of animal ecology, where I'm an associate editor, almost every last paragraph in the introduction tends to state very explicitly, these are the hypotheses that I am purporting to test within my study. And so those two bits of the introduction really are, are the bookends for where your, your ideas and what the basis of what you're, you're planning to discuss is coming from. The, the fourth pivotal paragraph is the first paragraph in the discussion. Again, this is, this is still in that narrow band of, of the hourglass. And generally speaking, it's a recapitulation, but um, for, for, uh, in, a, in a broader sense, um, it's a summary of the key results that, that you uncovered within your study. 
And then as things go broader and broader, like I said, the last paragraph of the discussion is really, again, it's a pivotal paragraph because it's, it's where you really are trying to tell people in, in as much freedom as, as, say, the editor and, and the reviewers may allow you, you're trying to tell people, now that you know what I have told you, what I, where I think people ought to be going is in this direction. And maybe you, you can even suggest future studies or future um, ways to test some of the, the ideas or hypotheses that you have. In terms of, of working through this structure, my own preference, and again, this is, this is actually um, this is something that I quite strongly advocate, but not everyone necessarily agrees. Uh, I always suggest, um, and I always approach things to my, myself, with starting with either the figures, because the, the figures really are defining, tend to define the, the main or most pivotal results within your, your study. Um, and perhaps maybe even the tables if, if whatever you're doing or whatever analysis doesn't necessarily lend itself to, to showcasing the, the outcomes in a, in a graphical format. And one of the nice things is because uh, a lot of the time we, you go out and you'll collect your data and you'll start to, you'll be running some analyses. The figures are really where you're, you're actually exploring some of the, the pieces and the ingredients that are going to go into what, what the, the story that you're going to be telling. And then what I also suggest is that um, even though you may have uh, an idea about the introduction, an idea about where you think things might be going in terms of the discussion, because writing the manuscript is not necessarily fun, and because even when you have the final manuscript, as Katie said, um, and as Allison is going to tell us, um, just because you have a manuscript submitted doesn't actually mean that the story has ended in terms of that study. Uh, I actually suggest that that working on the methods and results is the next best way to keep the momentum going because they tend to be the things that are clearest and the, and the methods if you've run an experiment the methods have already essentially been written before you conducted the experiment just not necessarily in in manuscript form and the same with the results the results are going to parallel what you've been showing or trying to show in, in say the figures in the tables and having those the figures, the tables, the methods, and the results they be very satisfying because then you start to really see things take shape, and you can get over some of the the sort of stumbling blocks or the writer's block where you really you feel like you're staring at a blank page because because you're not really sure where to go next. Um, so once you have your your general article structured and and you're you're putting things together. Uh, maybe you come al come along to the net one of the next steps, which is absolutely essential if you're going to publish things, which is actually picking a title for your study. Um, it sounds very very trivial, um, or it sounds like it should be simple, but it it never is. Um, and and it's because when you're picking a title, and this also relates to what what Katie said in terms of picking a journal, you really need to speak to the right audience, and you need to pitch things to to the right level. Um, uh, of the, the readership of the journal. My, as a general rule, I, I would say you, unless you're, necess you're um, publishing in, in a very specific journal, you don't really want to be too system specific. So if you're publishing in, in journals such as Functional Ecology or Journal of Animal Ecology, you still want to keep an idea about what the overarching importance of your study is. But if things are too general, then you're going to really leave your readers stranded. And what I mean is, if you say on a, a, a very esoteric or a very um, grandiose title like "On the Ecology of Plants Together," it's a terrible example. I, but I apologize. Nevertheless, um, it's a terrible example because it would be a terrible title for a paper um, because no one would really know what you're actually trying to to actually convey, and few people, some people might, but few people would, would probably be enticed to actually go forth and, and read the rest of the paper if they saw a title like that. So two, two really effective strategies and, and, um, that, that you'll find uh, are, are what I'm, I have in, in points three and four here. One, of, one strategy uh, is to highlight the key question or the key result or conclusion of your study. So I've picked 
a recently uh, published paper actually published by one of my students um, that I think is it very clearly transmits the idea about what, what we were studying, which was knowledge of predator-prey interactions improves predictions of immigration and extinction in island biogeography. Um, so it, there's not a, too much in terms of what the reader might expect. Um, but, uh, and, and so it, it certainly is reflective of, of what we aimed and ho hopefully succeeded in doing in our study. Um, however, sometimes having a very direct title is not necessarily the most satisfying thing. And actually, titles are one of the few places perhaps that we can be most creative and playful in a way that actually catches the reader's eye and actually entices them to go further. So um, the the last the title that I that I've picked here was was actually uh, published in the most recent uh, number of Journal of Animal Ecology. Uh, I do not speak French, but it says des differences pourquoi the why the difference, um, and then it's transmission, maintenance, and effects of phenotypic variants. And there's actually uh, a reasonable number of studies that say that uh, you can you can you can hide or you can get get away with sort of um, whimsical entries to to a title, uh, perhaps uh, interspersed with a with a colon or something like that. And then so long as you follow with something that's intelli sufficiently intelligible and captures the scientific quality, then people might actually be be quite their curiosity would really be piqued. Um, in addition, and and as the other piece that I have not uh, mentioned is the abstract. Well, I mentioned it in passing. Um, it is one of the the five pivotal paragraphs because, in by and large, if people are the the gate the gateway to reading the rest of an article is really being interested by the title and being enticed further by, by the abstract. So many people, including myself, might leave writing the abstract to the very last because you're not necessarily sure what, what you're going to have in that, very, that first pivotal paragraph from the very get-go or that uh, of the introduction or even in that last pivotal paragraph within your discussion. And those are really going to end up being the bookends of your abstract as well. Um, but it's not least important by any way, shape, or form. Um, and something that I think that, that people perhaps not all not everyone when they're writing loves the idea of having structure, but many journals, including uh, all of the the British Ecological Society journals, follow what's called a structured abstract format, um, which actually so if if I no, it's not included in the slides, but if I if I read the guidelines from say Journal of Animal Ecology again. The Journal of Anatomy Ecology no longer even has an abstract paragraph. It actually has has summaries, and it, the instructions are that the summary should have five points that list first the background, second the goal of the study, three what was done in the study, four what was found, and five what this actually means. And the, this structure comes from from a, a general sort of outline that fairly across across most of, of science, um, which is that most abstracts start with so-and-so, we already know something, X, and we also know something, Y. But we're not quite sure about the following thing, Z. And then people, you follow that with what you've actually tried to do. And so given the fact that we don't know Z, Therefore, we have done whatever. We ran our experiment, or we ran simulations, or we explored a particular hypothesis. And then uh, the effective abstract structure ends with, as a result, this is what we know, and this is where, this, where what we have discovered is going to take us next. Um, and when you have another key, the structured abstract, I, I say, is not your enemy because there's there's a reason why why these journals are very prescriptive because this is go this these structure the structures actually tell people precisely the pieces of information that that the reader tends to want and one other thing that that I want to say about the abstract is by 
never have never be afraid of giving away the punchline or telling all of the key results actually up front and in the abstract. Um, and and one reason perhaps to 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 summarize why that's important is is encapsulated in this quote from Winston Churchill, who said that. Please be good enough to put your conclusions and recommendations on one sheet of paper at the very beginning of your report so that I can even consider reading it. And the truth of the matter is, if you give away the results, that probably you're, you're better off for it because by and large, not everyone that actually gets the table of contents is going to read beyond your title and, and your abstract. And the people that are really interested need to need to be sure that it's going to be worth going any further. And the people that are marginally in interested, you can plant some seeds in their mind, but that, that may not actually change the fact that they're not going to go beyond the abstract because they, they saw something else that was more, maybe more in line with their interests. Um, and so at this point, I've, I've covered more or less the, the nuts and bolts and the key pieces, but um, there's certainly much more than just putting down enough words on the page. And it, we cannot forget that there are effective ways, and there's, there's good research to talk about what the, effect, the most effective way to, 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 um, to write a scientific study actually is. And one of the key things, and this is something that, you, that you, everyone who's ever read an article that lacks it can tell you, Good articles really tell a story. That doesn't mean that they tell the story in the same order that you conducted the experiments, and it doesn't necessarily tell the story in the same way that, that your idea actually came about or that you got the results. Um, but it tells an effective story because it's, there's a clear introduction, middle, and, and a conclusion that really wraps things up. And one of the trickiest bits, and I think uh, um, a key point that I'd like to make here in telling the story, is that if there is such a thing as too many results, an effective story has the right balance. And so you don't want to just cram everything that you've ever done into the paper just because you've done it. Because if that distracts people from, from that hourglass that you've, that you've tried to set out for them, then it's not going to work in your favor. Um, another important thing in terms of writing effective science is, is in point two, that it, clarity, coherence, and concision. And, and despite the alliteration here, the idea is that um, you really need to think about economy of words and write things as simply and uh, perhaps even eloquently, if possible, as possible. And, and one of the things along these lines that an idea that I read during my PhD that I always come back to was an idea from um, Henry G, who's a senior editor at Nature. And, what, and he was bemoaning the quality of, of written science. And he said that every scientist would benefit if we went back and read more Jane Austen and forgot about Victorian English and forgot about Shakespeare and, and didn't actually think that we're writing, have to write a paper like we were James Joyce, but actually focused on how simply can we actually write uh, a paper. And he even went so, so far as to say that um, native English speakers have a huge advantage over English speakers because they always focus on the simplest way to convey a message. Whereas people who are native, I mean, non-native English speakers write more effectively than native English speakers. I think I may have misspoke the first time. Um, and it's because if, if you're a native English speaker, maybe you were taught 100 different words to say, to say the simplest thing, whereas, and I'm going to skip one, uh, often you want to use plain English because plain English is going to be a much, much more digestible by the, your audience. And, and the way to summarize that is don't utilize, utilize, use, use. Both words mean the exact same thing, but use is, sounds much less, um, or is much easier to digest, say, than, than utilize. Um, along similar lines in point three, you really want to choose your words with care. A lot of even terms actually already have a basis within the ecology or evolutionary liter literature, and so you really don't want to mix mixed terms, and you also don't want to say things in, in, as, 
in a more complicated fashion than, than need be. Something else can help both in terms of the, the clarity and also when using plain English and trying to make things under, easy to understand is using the active voice. And so instead of saying the, the experiment was conducted under the following conditions, it's actually much more engaging and it's a more effective study show for you to j simply say, we conducted the experiment in the following conditions, we went and collected these data and, and so forth. Another important thing to, to remember, and um, unfortunately I'm going to have, have to correct this, is use short or mixed length sentences. One, one idea when we're thinking about clarity or coherence is actually that shorter and the shorter and sweeter the sentence is, the more effective. That is in general true and, and normally con and certainly a good baseline. But if you read short sentence after short sentence after short sentence, it can actually sometimes come across as very hypnotic. And so the, if you can re achieve a balance between shorter and, and medium or long sentences, it will actually be, um, it will be, the reader will respond much more positively. Another thing, and this goes back to the hourglass, um, but it also actually applies to every single paragraph that you write. Don't forget that just like a paper has an introduction at the middle and the discussion, every paragraph really has, should have, every effective paragraph will have an introductory sentence, some other sentences that establish an idea, and then the final sentences are going to actually wrap things up and bring things to a close so that there's a natural launching off point for the next paragraph. When, when you're editing your article, and, and this first point is, is reflected in the fact that I, I found an error in my own slides, don't, don't hesitate to brush up on the basics. Don't hesitate to go back and relearn some of the tricks of grammar, and maybe even learn so that you can have a, a better idea about what's going on and why something, some of the, the, the phrases or the writing that you use may not be as easy to understand as you might think yourself. Another thing that's really important when you're editing your article is avoid the urge to write the perfect sentence or paragraph. And, and this is a trap that I think a lot of people fall into, or probably everyone falls into at some point, and it's that you can, set, you can sit there and, as I was saying before, you design the paragraph and you end up working for hours on end in order to have the absolute perfect paragraph. The fact is, no paragraph will ever be perfect. No par There's never been a, an instance that I know of in recorded history where someone sent a paragraph to a co-author and, and they didn't get any comments back. And there's certainly never been an instance where they sent a per anyone sent a perfect paper to a journal, at least that I'm aware of. Another important thing is you should absolutely seek the opinions of others. One of the things that happens is that the more and more you look at, at your own perfect paragraph, or slightly imperfect paragraph, or, or your perfect paper in your mind, um, is that you've been sitting there and you know things much better than others. And when, when other people are confronted with whatever you've put together, there may be many, many things that actually make perfect sense to you, but that don't make perfect sense to, to anybody else. And uh, some actually a big proponent also of in terms of opinions of others. It's very common for you, obviously, to send it to your co-authors. It's very common to, to maybe send to lab mates. But I think it's also really good to send it to people outside of your group or even outside of your field, if possible, so that you can say, you can get a, a, an idea about how clear things are going to be. Another thing that's really important, and this, this is also relates to what Katie said about keeping a positive attitude, keep an open mind. Just because you think that you've written the, the greatest scientific article possible doesn't mean that other people might come back um, and, and c with really dramatic changes and tell you, oh, I don't understand the structure at all, um, and I think you should completely rearrange things. It's, that's always a possibility, and even if you disagree, usually there's at least an element, a slight element of truth to what, people, um, what other people's opinions have, hold. And so actually considering them and maybe even toying around with their ideas is really important, even if you, you 
are convinced that, that they're wrong, wrong and you're right. And then the last point, um, which, which I guess also is related to the second point, is that writing an article and editing your article or revising your article can sometimes feel like, like reading the instructions on a shampoo bottle. You can lather, rinse, and repeat over and over and over, but it's always important to remember that you should only do that as much as is necessary. And that's, be, again, going back to this idea that no matter, no matter what happens, chances are pretty good. You're going to get a lot of comments from, from reviewers, no matter how close to perfection you think your, your paper might actually be. Um, so another, the, let's see, the, the, last, the last thing before I get to, to my pro tip um, or my, my top tip is is the question of authorship and I left this to the end even though potentially it certainly influences the writing process um, I left it to the end because I think that even if it can sometimes be, be viewed as, as potentially a contentious discussion there really aren't things are becoming clearer at least in in theory uh, for who does and, and doesn't merit authorship um, and so rather than give you my own my, uh, my own biased opinion, um, or or anything like that. I I decided to take um, the criteria that are outlined by the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors, but it's a criteria that's also adopted by a number of other uh, science journals. That an author has to satisfy one of the following four criteria, at least one of the following four criteria. They either had to participate in the formulation of theory and prediction had made con contributions to experimental conception and design, participated in acquisition analysis and or interpretation of data, or even just drafting the article or revising it critically for important intellectual content. So in that last point, for example, if somebody caught a missing comma or, or noticed that you had the wrong tense in, in one place, that's probably not sufficient for authorship. Um, but it's usually pretty straightforward to figure out if people fall into one of these categories or if they don't. Another really important thing when, you're, when it comes to having the conversation though, as I said, this can be sometimes a contentious experience, um, especially uh, the younger you are I science. And a key thing to do is to always approach this question of authorship positively. What I mean is, normally, and similarly, Honesty is the best policy, and, and the best example that I can probably provide here is, is from my own experience where I was originally uh, the first author on a paper, but the, the duties started to divide, and it, be, it became fairly clear to me that uh, someone else really was, had ended up doing the lion's share of the work, and they, they probably deserved first authorship as opposed to me. And normally, this is the sort of thing that that is that can potentially even destroy collaborations or destroy friendships. But because both the other individual and actually just said we came to each other and we said, "I think we need to talk about the authorship." The fact that we both actually considered things uh, in terms of the honest act, the actual situation in an honest fashion as opposed to just wanting to, to your stick in the ground first or your flag in the ground first and claim things for yourself. We actually resolved it uh, quite quite amicably and remain collaborators to today. As I, I know that many scientists can tell far greater horror st stories about the authorship process depending on what, who felt they deserve things even when maybe the, the reality might not have been that. Um, another really important uh, thing to learn, um, and is, and be, this is really important also because it can vary from from lab, say, to lab that you might be working in, is to learn the cultures, uh, the different cultures about author order. So one of the standards, and probably the the thing that the vast majority of the people that are giving these presentations today w might operate with, is the idea of first authorship and last authorship being key indicators. First authorship is often the person who did the vast majority of the work, probably the vast majority of the writing, and last author it tends to be the person who is, say, the PI or the lead of the project. However, the way that author orders is, is, is 
assigned is, doesn't always follow that that format. And, and in fact, sometimes it's simply first to last in order of decreasing contributions. Sometimes it's even first author in follows that first authorship role that I described before. But maybe the rest of the authors are actually ordered alphabetically because they all did about the same. And why why actually try and make things more contentious than you have than you need to. And so it's really important to learn about the, the different cultures. And it's also different, important to learn about the different expectations that different authors might have and the way that they might interpret the order that you, that you have perhaps innocently put in your paper without actually considering what, what the consequences may be or who, who might actually be, be upset or offended. Um, so well, that's the, the last piece of, of the, the writing process that, that I wanted to talk about. Um, but as I said at the beginning, the, one of the things I really want to do is to help demystify. It's probably a lot of information, so maybe I didn't make it seem that much easier. Um, but the thing I want, so the point I want to leave you guys with is that paper, despite all of the different ingredients that I just talked about, it's not the same as building the Taj Mahal. You're not building the pyramids of Giza. It's not the Sagrada Familia that, that has, has been going on is probably going to be built for centuries. And, and I think the best, the most effective way that I can explain why it's not building the Taj Mahal is from this, this very loosely scientific study that I, that I conducted of, of my own papers that follow the, the IMRAD format, which is the Introduction Methods Results in Discussion. It, just by merely counting the number of paragraphs so different ingredients that go into a paper. And overall, my, these, these papers actually tended to have around 30 to 35 publications of, a, of a, our paragraphs, um, of about 250 to 300 words, so to say. And it's actually not just, so this is already, I think, squashing some of the, the, the limitations of, or you could write Ulysses, but you actually can't, in practice, publish Ulysses in a, in a scientific journal. And it's even simpler because, actually, if you look down, there's really only a fixed number of paragraphs that ever appear in, in different, um, different sections. So the introduction, results, and discussion tend to be somewhere between, say, five and 10 paragraphs, and no, no more and no less. Methods can vary substantially depending on how complicated things are, but really, when you're going out, you're trying to put together the different pieces. There's actually not that much. Um, there's there are far more constrictions and, and there's more structure than than may meet the eye uh, at first glance. And there's even as um, as Katie said as well. There's often very strong limits with some of the other things in terms of of figures and tables that you can have. Um. So as one last thing that I wanted to say, and these slides are going to be made available, um, thankfully, because I'm not going to read through all of this. Some of the things that I've talked about today are not my own ideas. I've actually pulled from uh, a number of, of references about how you might go about writing uh, academic papers and finding that story, or just figuring out how to avoid um, words like utilize in favor of words like use. And so I think I'll leave it at that. Right, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Daniel. That was that was absolutely great. I think if all authors paid close attention to it, it would make my life a lot easier. So, Alison is with us, I think. So yes, I am. Terrific. So, take it away, Alison. Well, so I get to wrap things up and to sort of talk about um, what happens once you finish that process that Daniel was just talking about. Um, so I'm sort of drawing on my expertise as an author, but also my expertise as an editor, three different journals, Functional Ecology, Fungal Ecology, and Pedobiologia. Um, and so, and the sort of things that I see that come in um, to those processes, or to, to being an editor there. Um, so the first thing you do now that you have spent all that time writing the paper, you've decided what journal you're going to um, to send your paper to is, and this is something that people often forget about, is that they have to write a cover letter. And 
a lot, and I see this coming into as an editor, and I've seen a shift over time that the cover letters become more and more and more important. And the higher the impact of the journal, the more important that cover letter is. Um, so I'd encourage you to not blow it off, but to actually spend some time on your cover letter making sure that it highlights for the editor what it is that you are saying in your paper um, and why they should publish it. Because this is really the first thing that we see when things come in. We get your, we get your paper, we get all of that, and then we get this cover letter. Um, and, um, and so I'm going to just give you sort of some tips for how to write an effective cover letter. So the first thing that you're going to do um, is create um, a letter in which you start off with what you're submitting, just a short statement about saying, I'm submitting this to this journal, um, and a short statement about how great it is. And, and in, the, in the background of this, you'll see this is actually an adapted cover letter that, that I sent in for a paper that's published that I modified um, to uh, remove um, any, any incriminating evidence, I suppose. Um, so you start off with that short statement about the greatness of your, your paper. Um, and then you really want to spend the next paragraph talking about what is the take-home message of your paper. So if you go to the conclusions of your paper, what are the, the things that you really want your readers to take away from this? Um, and then in the following paragraph, this is where you need to convince the editor that your paper should be published in their journal. Okay, So you need to highlight what is novel and interesting. And I find that bullet points often work well here. Um, this is also a spot, there are certain journals that will ask you a series of questions like, is your work novel? Can you prove that your work is novel? Um, does your, you know, how does your, um, your paper address the um, remit of our journal? That kind of thing. So that, this is where you want to answer those questions. And it is really important to answer those questions because editors are looking for any reason to reject a paper. Um, and this has become one of the ways um, to, to do that. And in the final paragraph, you kind of, it's what I call, it contains assurances um, that you haven't published your paper elsewhere, that all the authors have seen and agree. You've already heard the discussion about authorship, so you, ha you have to prove that you've, or at least say that you've had that conversation before you submit it. Um, it's very embarrassing. Um, uh, we'll get into that later if you, if you haven't done that. Um, and then that if your paper has been previously reviewed, um, it's also good to mention that here, a lot of journals are now requiring that you provide proof that your paper has been reviewed um, by someone. So whether it was your you know, office mate Jim or your friend Hazel, that they went through and read the paper and made comments on it. Um, so that's, that's what you put there. And then you say, you know, you put your salutations and you list all of the authors. Um, so it's a it's a basic cover um, basic sort of letter and letter style um, and that should help you figure out what to to put into the cover letter and everyone always leaves this to the last minute but I really encourage you to take some time to think about it um, because it depends again on the impact factor of the journal but in, in the case of ooh, I'm losing my my slide there um, in the case of, for example, Nature, the first thing they do is look at your cover letter. And if you don't convince them that they should send your paper up for review, um, they won't do it. Uh, and so they won't even look at your paper. They just look at your cover letter first. So it is actually important. And the importance of it is increasing in the um, journals that have even low, have impact factors that are lower than, than Nature and Science as well. So, um, so now you get to the stage where you're submitting your manuscript. Um, and I'm going to just um, state, as um, both Katie and Daniel said, it's really important that before you begin one la before you begin to submit your manuscript, read one last time the journal remit. Um, so make sure it really does match. Um, the author guidelines is really important. Um, inevitably, I've always forgotten to do something minor like number the pa the the lines or something like that. And make sure that you've read the cover letter guidelines as well. So sometimes these will be with the author guidelines, sometimes they'll be in a different location on the web page. And some journals don't have cover letter guidelines, in that case it's just fine, but, um, but there are going to be some, they're, they're usually they'll require you to include some kind of statement saying, you know, we haven't published this somewhere else, or we've done this or done that. 
Then you need to um, take a moment before you start the process to identify potential editors and reviewers. So you can go through the um, information about the journal that's on the journal webpage and look for what different editors there are. Look for an editor that's going to understand your paper. Um, so if your paper meets the remit of the journal, there should be an editor on the panel that is going to um, understand your topic area better. So if you're submitting something about fish, you want to make sure that your um, paper goes to an editor who works on fish as opposed to an editor who works on, say, plants, for example, because your fish editor is going to understand the nuances of better than someone who, who studies um, something else. Um, and then make sure you have the email addresses for all of your authors um, because you're likely going to need them later on in the process. And then, I know this sounds like you've reached the end and it seems like it's so easy, but really I recommend that you reserve at least two hours for the manuscript submission process. It, it, it sounds silly, but it's surprising how long it can take you to get through this process. And if you rush through it, um, you can result, it can lead to um, the paper being rejected immediately because you didn't do something right or you didn't click the right button. Um, so make sure you've got enough time to actually submit the manuscript. Um, so then I'm an editor at Functional Ecology, so um, it's my, my example, and this is the BS2, so it's my example journal. And so when you go in and you log in to um, the, the corresponding author dashboard on Scholar One that's run by, that's run for Functional Ecology by them, you're going to have a couple of things that you, it's going to take you through all these steps, and you can kind of see um, this, this isn't in really good uh, um, clarity, but you can see that there's a series of steps, seven steps that you have to go through to submit your manuscript. Um, in each one, you have to do different things at each one. So you've got your, your um, what kind of um, uh, paper you're going to submit, the title and the abstract on the first page. And it's, it's you know, relatively intuitive. You just fill in the sections as directed on the web page. I recommend cutting and pasting um, so that you don't have any mistakes between between your actual title and because what goes into the electronic system is what you type in here and that's what gets sent out to reviewers and to the editor. It's not what's actually on your paper. So cutting and pasting will help you avoid any kind of embarrassing mistakes. Um, so then um, if you're moving along and you've entered your, you know, um, various different information, um, your authors, their affiliation, addresses, that kind of thing. Um, then you get to this this page that in every journal that will ask you about reviewers. And I really highly recommend that you have a think as well about preferred reviewers or non-preferred reviewers. Um, there have been several studies that have shown that an inc you when you list preferred and non-preferred reviewers, you increase your likelihood of acceptance. Um, and uh, I'll go on and explain partly why that is in just a little bit. Um, but it, it helps out the editor quite a lot if you, if you can at least point them in the right direction of someone who you think might be willing to review your work. In addition, um, Identify, you should identify editors that are going to understand the topic and importance of your paper. So this also increases the likelihood of acceptance, I think. I've already given an example of that. Um, so this is, don't, don't skip past this, because you can. You can skip past it, but um, you're actually shooting yourself in the foot if you do. So then um, when you get to the submitting your manuscript step the, and you're ready to, to um, submit it, and the most important step, absolutely most important step of submitting your manuscript is to review it before you press the submit button. Um, and this, this is really my top tip. <laughs> um, so always download your paper and review it before you submit it because for some reason when you upload things, there's inevitably some, some mistake that you've missed. Um, one thing that happens frequently to me is even if I've accepted all the track changes in the document, for some reason they'll still all pop up when it gets converted to a PDF. And that's not something you want to be sending out to reviewers. Um, 
In addition, sometimes the figures don't come out looking correct. Um, and you need to format them cert you know, in certain ways for, for final submission to the journal, but sometimes people like to put them into their main document. And sometimes when they do that, it doesn't quite come out the way they thought it would. And sometimes there are these like glaring mistakes that you just for some reason never noticed until it showed up in PDF form. Um, and I was submitting a paper with a student. It was his first paper to be submitted. And I kid you not, we reviewed the document four times <laughs> before it was actually ready to go out. Um, so once, once you finally reviewed the whole thing um, and you press that submit button, you need to go and celebrate. You should celebrate it every step of this process because it can be can be a little bit depressing. But you need to you need to say, okay, I have actually accomplished something great. I spent all of this time, this four years, in the case of the the um, comic that um, Katie presented, and there's you know it's, you should really celebrate that you did that um, and and pat yourself on the back that you actually went through the whole process and submitted it. So it's a big deal. Okay, so so what happens after you submit that paper? Um, well, then that paper comes to someone like me who reads the paper and asks the following questions. Um, or to Ken, for example. So does it address the remit of the journal? If it doesn't, then it'll go for an immediate reject. They won't even bother, we won't even send it out for review. Just immediately say, no, that's not appropriate, and we'll send it back to you. Um, if the, um, the next thing we ask is, do the methods, the results, and the conclusions appear to be appropriate for what the authors have done? If they haven't, if they don't appear to be that way, then again, we'll reject it immediately, because there's a serious flaw with the paper. Um, then, then, once we get past those steps and we decide that the paper should go out for review, we then have to go through and pick um, six different reviewers in the case of functional ecology, and I try to stick with that for all the other journals as well. Um, and usually what we do is we've got six people on the list and we invite the first three people on the list. Typically what I try to make sure happens is that there's one person from your prefer preferred reviewer list. Um, then I choose based on if the paper covers multiple fields, I try to make sure there's at least one person from each field. Um, and then I try to look for diversity in gender, world region, and career stage um, so that we get a good, broad assessment of the paper that we're looking at. And then after all that hard work of selecting reviewers, all six of them typically decline, and then I have to start all over again. Um, so have some sympathy for your editor when, <laughs> when you're not hearing anything. It's probably because it's summer, and everyone's in the field, and no one has time to review, or it's Christmas, and everyone's gone, on, gone somewhere else. Um, and they, they don't want to spend their New Year's Eve reviewing a paper. And so you, you, you kind of, sometimes your best laid plans um, go to the wayside. <laughs> um, but we, we try. Um, so then once the, the reviewers finally come back to you, usually you'll get two to three reviews back, depending on the journal, depending on the availability of reviewers, that kind of thing. Um, and the, the Handling editor will read those reviews, and there'll be two sections to those reviews. There'll be a section that's only for the editor, and there's a session section that's for the author and for the editor together. And then the handling editor will base their decisions on the issues that are raised by the reviewers, um, the quality of the reviews. So it is important to me, if I get a review back um, and someone spent a lot of time on it and they've done a lot of thinking about it, um, I'm going to give a little bit more weight to that review than to one where someone said, yeah, well, it's okay, and not written a lot of comments. Um, or if I agree or disagree with some of the, the important factors that reviewers bring up. So I really will um, sort of look at the issues, the quality, and, and also see what the reviewers' opinions are. And then I'll think about what my opinion is um, and whether or not um, it's influenced by, by the comments of the reviewers. And then I will make a decision. Um, and there are, there, depending on the journal, there are a lot of different decisions that you can receive. But these are the major ones that um, you'll receive 
over time. The first one is accept, and I would say that never, ever, ever, ever happens happens, at least not the first time that it comes in. Um, Daniel already mentioned <laughs> that um, reviewers never think anything is perfect, um, and that's really their job. It's not to um, see perfections, to see um, what's wrong with things. So, you, so never ever are things going to get accepted with no um, changes. So never get upset if you never get an acceptance that's just straight out, um, just, you know, that's fine. Um, but the other options are major revisions. Um, which is possibly the most common decision. Minor revisions, um, reject with an invitation to resubmit. Um, so usually if you get major revisions, um, you have a specific amount of time that the journal will allow you to resubmit within. If you get reject with an invitation to resubmit, not always, but frequently, there's a lot more leeway about that. Um, but it depends upon the journal, and you have to read the, the letter that you get back from the editor carefully. You can also nowadays get rejected, but passed on to an associated journal with the review. So they'll say, you know, we've rejected your paper. We won't publish it in our journal, but we have a sister journal. We have an agreement with that sister journal that we will pass on um, the reviews to that journal, your, your paper with the reviews to that journal, so they can make a decision themselves about whether or not they would accept it for them. And one of the advantages to that, of course, is that you don't have to go through the whole reviewer process again, um, but you can, you can uh, and sort of skip, skip a step when you resubmit to another journal. And then finally, um, reject. So, if you receive a rejection, um, my PhD supervisor gave me some very good advice when I first received my first rejection. Um, he said, never, ever, ever call up or email an editor after you've received a decision and call them an idiot. <laughs> um, and this is really good advice. Um, I would recommend that you stick to it. I would wait until you're calm, even if you think they've really made a mistake. Um, no one responds really well to being, you know, accused of anything. And so, just calm down. Take however much time it's going to take you to sort of look at things from a, a calm perspective, and then then ask yourself a question: Did they really make a mistake? Um, was there something that um, one of the reviewers completely got incorrectly, um, or is there something that was very clearly not understood by the editor? And then, in that case, you can petition. But you need to be aware that when you petition, first of all, you need to be incredibly polite, right? You are treading on the goodwill of the editor. So never, you should, should always be really polite and avoid phrases like, you are wrong, or you just don't know what you're talking about, or you didn't get it right, because um, those are very accusatory, and no editor is going to respond positively to that. Um, in addition, they don't have to respond positively to it. So unless you are you know, contrite and polite, no editor is going to listen to you. In addition, even if you do petition, the editor has the right to not listen to your petition at all. There's nothing that states that they need to listen to you. Secondly, um, even if they do allow you to resubmit the paper, you should expect only a 30% success rate because your paper is going to go back out to review and go through the whole process again. So you have to ask yourself, you know, is the mistake that was made really going to make a big difference in whether or not this paper is accepted? So it's one of those, as Katie was saying, it's one of those opportunities to be really honest with yourself. Um, and then you want to also say, is there a flaw that you've made in the paper that you can address for the next submission? And this is, I guess this is maybe a secondary top tip. It's one of the things that really, really annoys me because I have to work in a relatively small field. So always, always address the reviewer's comments before you submit to the next journal, please. Because in my relatively small field, if you don't do that, it's likely going to come back to the exact same reviewer. Um, and so if they see that you haven't even bothered to listen to anything that they recommended for you, they are not going to be thrilled to, you know, when they review it again, they're not going to say nice things. 
they're going to be even harsher. And I know it sounds like, oh, well, this is, this is nobody would do that. But I once, I once reviewed a paper three times for three different journals in which they never addressed any of my comments. And by the third time, I was not a nice reviewer. <laughs> um, and so do keep that in mind that, you know, this is not a huge field. Um, and so, and the reviewers have spent time trying to help you make your paper better. Um, so don't ignore their efforts, even if you didn't get accepted to that journal. Um, and if you received a major minor revisions decision, I would say first thing you should do is go celebrate, um, because this is this is a huge accomplishment. Um, it doesn't mean 100% that your paper is going to be accepted, but it's a big step in the right direction. Um, and so, you know, take that opportunity to go out and grab a beer or whatever it is that you want to do to celebrate, you know, pat yourself on the back because that's, that's, you know, a really good thing. Um, and then what you need to do is to really sit down and carefully read through all of the reviewer's comments because what a reviewer is doing when they review your paper is they're trying to help you improve your manuscript. Um, and so you want to... It can feel like a very um, confrontational kind of experience, but what you really want to do is keep in mind that they are actually making comments to help you, um, and then go through each of those comments um, and respond to them, and the editor will make comments as well. And when you're responding, make sure to be polite. Remember um, that the reviewers are helping you, even if it doesn't always sound like that on paper. Um, and also, reviewers often get to read your responses and decide if you've addressed their comments appropriately. And if you're aggressive and you say, oh, well, this reviewer doesn't really know what they're talking about, um, and the reviewer reads that, they're not going to say to the editor, oh, yeah, I think you should accept this paper. Um, they're going to let their emotions kind of cloud their opinions, and that's not good for you. Um, then you want to explicitly number each comment and list where in the text you've made changes. I really can't recommend too much line numbers. Um, and make every possible change that they've requested. Um, so limit the number of comments that you can test to as few as possible. There are going to be some where you either can't make the changes they require or you think that making the changes they've asked for um, will change the meaning or the importance of what you're trying to talk about. Um, so have a sit down and think about every single change that they've asked and say, is it really that important? Can I make that change to make them happy? Even if it's something as silly as, you know, I want to change the grammar here. Do whatever it takes to make that, to respond to that comment. Um, and then, and then so that you can, you can sort of store up those one or two things that you disagree with. Um, because if, if a reviewer sees that you've made an effort um, in the, resubmission, then they're less likely to come back harshly. Definitely avoid phrases like, you are wrong, anything accusational. Um, and I like to utilize my co-authors to make sure that I tone down any confrontational responses. If I'm contesting a particular comment, um, I often find in myself that it can be challenging to not say, oh, you're an idiot, you just don't get it. Um, and so. Uh, sometimes I have to go through three or four revisions, so I get something that really is um, much sounding much more positive. So, so do work with your co-authors, um, particularly for for those kinds of responses, but for for all of them as well. Um, they're going to be curious to see how things are going, even though you're if you're the um, lead author, you get you know it is your responsibility to deal with most of this or the the communicating author, but. It's important also to interact with your co-authors because they they want to know what the process is, how where you are in the process, and and they'll often you know they may even have it be their job if they did this analysis to address that particular that particular issue as well. So make sure to utilize them too. And that would be everything that I have to say. Well, not everything, but for for this now. That's that's absolutely. Terrific, Alison. Some great advice there, and I would, I would just, um, I would, I just add actually that um, on the subject, something you mentioned earlier, which is preferred reviewers. Um, we <coughs> say we, 
the senior editor of functional ecology has just done an analysis of this whole subject using functional ecology submissions. And um, it's certainly the case that if you suggest preferred reviewers and one of your preferred reviewers is chosen to actually review your paper, they tend to give your paper a higher rating than non preferred, or rather, not non preferred, but um, reviewers chosen independently um, by the editor. So, all journals, in fact, functional ecology now compel you to choose, um, to suggest from the review. Not all journals do that, but they all give you the opportunity. So, if they give you the opportunity, my advice is to take it. If one of those reviewers is used, it can, it can make a difference. Um, <clears throat> I think we're nearly. I think we're nearly at the end of this. That's that's uh, that's really been terrific. All, all I was going to finish was uh, one of. There has been a question come in that's basically said, and this refers to what you said, uh, Alison. How long mm -hmm. should the cover letter be? And just to give you my senior editor's take on it, uh, that's a very difficult question to answer. And it depends enormously, I think, on the journal. Um, the, the really top end journals, places like Nature and Science, in my experience, the cover letter is very important because these journals get so many submissions. That they scarcely have time, frankly, to even read the abstracts of all of them, and so a lot of um, I think a lot of actual decisions are made based on the on the content and the quality of the, of the cover letter, and so therefore the cover letter there is very important. So it's important that it should say what it needs to say, but it shouldn't be too long. It should be it should in fact be as concise as possible. Moving along the gradient of the journals that Katie identified in the beginning, from sort of nature at one end to the Fern Gazette at the other, I think the cover letter becomes less and less important as you move along the journal. And personally, as a senior editor, uh, I don't take all that much notice of cover letters. I, I, I hate to, I hate to say that to all you cover letter writers out. So I tend to base my judgment on the paper, not on what the author tells me. I tend to think, okay, I have the paper. That will tell me whether it's any good or not, irrespective of what you tell me about the paper. But you, you may you may want to add something to that. I don't know. Or 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 indeed either of the, the either of the other questions. Um, well, I, I generally to think of it as one page. Generally speaking, I think all cover letters should be one page. Um, it can be shorter than one page. I don't usually press it to be longer than one page, unless you've got these situations that Ken's talking about, where you've got kind of the importance of the cover letter really rising to the top. But it, you really need to make sure, though, that you cover, like, for example, functional ecology doesn't really ask you to answer a lot of questions in the cover letter. But for example, New Phytologist has moved to a format where you have to provide almost a paragraph response to three different questions. In that case, your cover letter is just going to get longer because of, of that, that sort of added bit that you have to put in. So it, it'll depend. Um, I mean, I, I, I like, you know, one one page, um, but uh, but it it is as Ken said, it's really going to vary depending on the journal and depending on on um, what the requirements are. Okay. And did anyone else want to add anything to the? the um, I would add. I would just say that um, I've never written a cover letter of more than a page, regardless of where I've sent anything. I think as soon as you start going over one page, you're going to lose interest of whoever's reading it. And like <clears> Ken said, you've got the paper. So if they are interested in it, they've got the paper to read all that detail. Like just try and be as concise as possible and stick to one page as an absolute maximum. Okay. 
I think we're I think we're almost out of time really, and so I'm just going to wind things up now. Um, firstly, thank our presenters um, for three really really terrific useful uh, presentations. They were all asked to provide a top tip, and I'm going to add my top tip. No one asked me to provide one, but I did. Um, and that is, um, never forget that even before you start doing the work, that the final product of your research is a scientific paper. Therefore, even when you're planning your research, you're planning how long you should spend on it, you're planning how many replicates there should be, you're planning how complicated your controls should be, you name it, always be asking yourself, Difficult question that a picky reviewer is going to eventually ask when he reads the paper. Because if you've got something wrong during the planning and execution of your research, it's no good following anyone's excellent advice later about writing it. Then it's too late. So get things right before you even start. So that's my top tip. I'd just like to say that, once again, thanks very much to, to everyone, to Samina Zaman at BES for organizing this. The BES doesn't have any further webinars planned um, in the near future. This one will be online soon, so you can listen to it again. And there are other BES webinars out there on other subjects. Um, so go to the BES website and check those out. Thank you very much.